Uh, I've met a That's ton a victory of victory for just... me, by the way. <laughs> I've met a ton of uh, Ratchet fans who work in the industry. I guess there's a lot of them, and uh, they uh, one of the things they love about this game is sort of the the little quirks like that. You know, the intros on the enemies, the attention to detail. So it it's you know I wouldn't say it was useless. Is sort of where I'm going with that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those things, uh, again, where we mentioned this in the very first episode. It's uh, When it's there, some people might not really notice it. But when it's not there, people will know something's off. And it's, you know, it's uh, finding what those things are that, you know, the people... It, you got to train yourself to really look at things and say, why is this wrong? Why is this not working? That is totally not faster. It is faster. Where are you going? Why are you going this I way? I need to go buy ammo. Oh, I see. Uh, I wasn't going to interrupt your train of thought, though. <laughs> so, no. yeah, I mean, it's... um, it's This level was very strange. and I, We had a couple questions uh, on our previous episodes as to what exactly I meant when I say I did a level. And uh, I mean everything. I, and I don't say that to be pompous. I say a lot of things to be pompous. I'm not saying this to be pompous. It, but can I can I just break in on you real quick? Yeah, sure. Trivia, tr a piece of trivia. Uh, Craig Goodman did the art in this level, and each of these binary sequences actually means something. Right. Yes, that's uh, absolutely they true. They spell out something in ASCII, uh, and he, so he hit a whole bunch of messages in the level that way. So sorry, Tony. Go go back. You said when you did a level, it really meant. I mean, I did the whole level, and uh, from everything down to like the effects that get shot from the from the characters to their AI, to you know what those little cars. Uh, I don't think I think we might have actually had a generic system for the cars by this because time we had we so did, many of yeah. them. Because I mean that's another thing, another sort of insomniac touch that the requirement, they requirement yeah required for all the levels is. Something always had to be happening am ambiently in the background. Yeah, it had to be moving, especially from the opening view. You needed right. to see things moving around in the sky because it gave you a sense of, of depth and also dy dynamic dynamism, I guess. Yeah, you never wanted things to just be static. Everything, something always had to be going on. Yeah, and they really just pays look off. at those guys. They just slide around the floor when you hit them like that. That was horrible. <laughs> I'm surprised Ted didn't fire you. I know. It's amazing that I still had a job there. He does hate the foot sliding. Man. It's really one of his pet peeves. Like, I, I, at least it used to be. I can't I can't claim that it's still his pet peeve. I mean, just really big props to, to Ted, because we haven't been sort of talking about how Ted influenced these games too much. But That's true. He has a huge attention to detail. Oh, my God. Ted's yeah. attention to detail is unrivaled. And, and, uh, and an uncompromising, uh, a, like, desire for quality. Right, like he just so, he demands it of everybody who works at his company. So Ted is has a very interesting influence on this game because he doesn't actually participate hands on with the development anymore, or at least not when we were making these games. Right, he doesn't he doesn't code, he doesn't do art, but his uh, influence is so powerful. Despite that, yeah, I mean he had, had his hands on everything in one way or another. Nothing gets in, put in the game without Ted putting his eyes on it, and, a, and, and that's know, pretty and a much how it works. Um, you, you were saying something? I was saying, yeah, and approving it. Right. And so it's uh, the, his attention to detail. And he, he's he really, when something is wrong, he does not let it slip through. Yeah, it, it will and not stand. It was frustrating at times. But at the same time, the game would not have been what it was without him being there and demanding the level of quality that he did. And out of everything that went into the game. And really force, forcing everybody there to sort of step up their game. Yes. If I remember correctly, this launches or something. No, I think that one just breaks away. Not all the breakables can be amazing. As if they were all amazing, none of them would what be. What am I thinking of? There was, oh no, that was in a later level where they, they launch up like rockets into the sky. Mm-hmm. Breakables are so good on this level. Yeah, they and did. Greg did some great breakables on this level. With no physics middleware at all, they can no, do things none. like having those balls fall and, and, and bounce around and bouncy balls. I don't like those elevators. You could have done a better job with those elevators. I yeah, what, done a better job what the hell, elevators. Tony? Let's let's talk about how much you suck for those elevators. <laughs> I think the the glass breakable was actually me though. I think yeah. I might have done the glass 
because it was so integral to the gameplay, the way the glass had to break when the roots jumped through them, that I think I might have actually done those early on. But yeah, this was another huge pathfinding problem in this section. Jesus Christ, what well, were we thinking? Given a lack of pathfinding, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they had to cut across the bridge and they had to chase you around these whole sections. And I, I think it wasn't until Up Your Arsenal that you came up with a pathfinding solution for all your stuff. Uh, well, yeah, Peter had come up with a pathfinding solution that I had borrowed for this section, for sure. Because it was it's impossible to do this without pathfinding. It's just impossible. So Peter had his own pathfinding section, which I borrowed a lot. But I came up with my own sort of hacky, weird one. Uh, oh, so we just put a nanotech boost there yeah, because when we that, took out the gadget. Because that was originally, yeah. The water gadget. And you have to have a reward at the end of the segment. Right. Because otherwise, you know, the player will feel gypped. Uh, you know what? I think you had to shoot the boats out of the water with the sniper rifle to get the skill mm. point. Uh, oh, and there's the uh, pulse rifle, sorry. I think oh, you should save up for those synthenoids. I think that's the next thing you got to save up for. But the pulse rifle was awesome. You gotta... I'm not saying, yeah, it's great. But the synthenoids is another one of those broken weapons. Maybe and, we'll uh, go back, uh, either go back and do a, a, an episode on, you know, us gaining money to get the synthenoids. Or, well, you know what? Uh, or do that in secret and then, you know, record. <laughs> record While we're talking post. about broken weapons really quick, um, just another sort of interesting thing I want to get your take on is sort of, how difficult was it when designing weapons for Ratchet and Clank? Because when you make something that's broken, it's going to be fun. Uh, break overpowered broken things are always fun. Yep. So how is how difficult is it to look at a weapon and say, well, is this fun because it's fun, or is it fun because it's broken? Well, I because was... I think we have a I think a couple of weapons sort of are really riding that line between just sort of fun and being completely out of balance with everything in the game. Well, I was fortunate enough to not have to be the one who made that call on uh, any of the Ratchet games. Like, I never balanced the the stuff in, in these games, but uh, I, I remember them losing a lot of sleep over it. And uh, one of the... Uh, like, so in addition to, you know, the obvious things, you know, tweak the numbers and, you know, keep trying, you know, user test, user test, user test. There was a... Uh, like, people still just didn't want to buy new weapons. Mm -hmm. You know, they would uh, uh, they would like what they had too much. And to a certain extent, sometimes that was because they were broken, and sometimes that was just because it was comfortable. Right. Uh, and so we had a hard time getting people to want to buy new weapons. So a, a balancing uh, challenge on top of what you were talking about was also just, how do we make these not too good so that people will, you know, never want to buy another weapon again. Interesting. That's very true. That we do want people to constantly be progressing and moving forward. And the the, the solution that they ended up going for with that was to uh, obsolete weapons as you, oh, not the dynamo, uh, obsolete weapons as you uh, as you went through the game. So since all of the enemies get harder with every level, uh, nice. The pistons stop moving. Yeah. Uh, since all the enemies get harder with every level, uh, you know, your weapons get less and less effective unless you upgrade them. Uh, and since there were only two levels of upgrades, eventually a weapon will become obsolete. And the tuning and balancing of that, I mean, up to the last minute, like, you know, I think they were still changing the balancing by the time we were submitting for gold the third time. If I remember correctly, the Rift Cannon was originally conceived to be in this game. But yeah. was cut because it was too powerful. Way too powerful, yeah. I, I think uh, Roberto made it. Yeah. Uh, and I think it eventually made it into one of the later games. I'm not exactly sure what changed between and, this early prototype and what we ended up putting into the game. Well, it's funny, talking about weapons that didn't make it into the game, um, uh, both Colin and I, for this game, proposed the Groovatron. Do you remember? <laughs> from from uh, Tools of Destruction, where it, uh, it throws out a huge disco ball and makes people dance. Oh, and that guy's stuck. Or something. He's not looking like he's running right. <laughs> I, I think in the original version of the Groovatron, it was called the Rainbow Afrolyzer. What was and I doing? How are why are these bugs so all? Of, I'm sorry to, I I'm sorry. I I'm disrupting you. And I'm sorry. That's okay. I'm just gonna pretend like you didn't say anything and keep going on. With Go yeah. Can, yeah. So the Rainbow Afronator. Yeah, it was called the Rainbow Afronator, and the idea was that every the disco ball would go up, afros would spawn on all of the the characters, and then 
they would all do a disco dance. Uh, and it was shot down mainly because, you know, on the PlayStation 2, how are you going to fit all those dance animations in memory? Yeah, memory, exactly. And mm -hmm. um, But a yeah. lot of there were a lot of weapons that came up in later games that we pitched in earlier games and just couldn't do because we hadn't figured out the technology for it yet or just because, you know, it was going to be too much of a pain in the ass with all the other things, like, you know, the spider bot cannon we had in this game and... Just tons of there were there was already a, we were already biting off more than we can chew. We didn't need to bite off more than that. I love these explosions that are coming up with these barrels. Oh, these are good barrels. You this is good. Right. This is good anti frame rate horribleness that's coming up. Okay, let me let me single out these barrels because. Okay, hang on. Look at that. And every now, every now and then, some one of one will just shoot up into the sky, just yep. to give you a little variation. Because you know what, you can't just have them all just blow up and stay. Some every now and then, one's going to fly up into the sky and then blow up. Yep, like that. That's right. Another, you know, interesting way to introduce the enemies: jumping over the barrels. Oh, I have a something I did in this level. So as yes. a, as a junior designer, one of my responsibilities was to go through the levels later in the game and place golden bolts or platinum bolts and you know things like that and I, I think I placed one in here yes this is there is a dynamo challenge yeah a challenge sorry <laughs> what, what were you gonna you were gonna say something before I rudely interrupted you no I was just saying there's a you know more interesting ways to introduce the enemies here jumping over the barrels and uh, it's one of those weird things is that uh, in these games enemies didn't really jump too much because jumping is hard to make look good. So, very difficult. So hard. So we had these very fixed jumps that these guys made. And this kind of wet my appetite to one of my bigger failures uh, or in my tenure at Insomniac, was, which was to constantly try to introduce jumping enemies. And I never succeeded. Because jumping is very hard. All right, I'm going to do this dynamo thing. Yeah, make it happen. Oh, that camera. Uh, you know, Roberto, though, Roberto would say that it was not his fault. Well, you should have, you should be able to do something like that, make that jump. There right, should have been a collision have, there. We should have put invisible collision or something. Well, again, another rule that we're not allowed to do on Ratchet and Clank games, or weren't allowed to do at Ratchet and Clank games, is big invisible collision walls were banned. Yep, uh, that that was two PlayStation One. All right, here we go. I love there's no timer on screen. You have no oh, yeah. idea how to, how long you have to do this crap. Like this, oh man, I would fire myself. <laughs> but you know what? It's not a critical path challenge, so it's okay. You know, it's one of those things where I'm astounded I, I held my job there after looking at all the horrible things that were wrong in this game. <laughs> uh, the fact that I didn't get yelled at more by Ted was astounding. Really? The door closes on <laughs> really, but there's a dynamo section. Dy I remember we put that dynamo thing in there because the door closed on you, because of the way the dynamos work that we couldn't keep that door open. Stupid as it sounds, clearly five minute fix if you were to go look at it now. But clearly nobody had the time to actually implement a door that stayed open during actual production. Well, it, so we just put another dynamo trigger. Well, that that challenge went in, you know, post beta when we were doing the replay plans. Yeah, stuff. so. I mean, it's no surprise that we didn't have time to do that. All right, here comes the cutscene. That was another. This was another one where we had to do that very awkward camera move way up into the sky because of the way that jump was set up. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I was just agreeing with you. Yeah, that's fine. I was being the Ed McMahon to your Johnny Carson. Every so often, when you say something, you know, particularly useful, I'll just go. <laughs> but I'll have to. We do put that a lot of we, we put a lot of good money sinks in this game too. The ship upgrades and the uh, the weapon mods and all that kind of stuff were were pretty good ways to spend all those extra things that you're getting. I think the the ship upgrades you buy with rare titanium. Rare titanium, yeah. Someone inside might know where the thief. Definitely lots of different currencies though, so lots of ways to reward. Uh, different stuff. Yeah, that camera cut's way awkward. That is a harsh camera cut. Look at that. 